By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have some X points action for you. X points finals 13 to be precise between David and Rob. Now, before I jump into the decks, I would first like to point out that this is an X points format. What does that mean? Well, first off, they're playing according to the Atlantic rule set. So that means Fallen Empire is a thing. Also, Mana Burn is real, right? Those two things are different from, for example, Swedish old school magic. And um, they are also playing according to the X points point list. So X stands for 10, so they can spend 10 points on cards that have points allocated to them. So here you can see the list that was used for this uh, finals. And the cool thing is this list is not set in stone. It can change. So on their Facebook page and on their Discord, they have discussions about cards. And before a new tournament starts, there's always the possibility that cards go up in points or down in points. So this makes it kind of a flexible format. And I think the goal of this is to keep it interesting and to see a lot of diverse decks. Well, here in the finals, we do see two different decks, but both of these decks have uh, land taxes in them. And that, of course, has a big influence on the rest of the deck. Now, first off, we've got the deck of David. It's called Winter Geddon. It's uh, white and it's green, and he's playing a little bit of black, by the way, and he's playing against um, Rob, Rob Hackney, and his deck is uh, white and red, and is called Tex, or sorry, it's called Agro Tex. Now, before I jump into the deck text, I've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks. I would first like to point out that this video has, as always, timestamps. So if you wanna go straight to the games, for example, all you have to do is check the description below and there you will find a timestamp that reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the games. And as for now, we're going to start with the deck deck. I'm actually going to start with the deck uh, Winter Geddon by David. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of David. Now this deck probably looks familiar to you because we've, we've seen this deck Winter Geddon in the finals of the monthly number 12. So that was the last time because then David's deck also got all the way to the finals. I think, David, you probably made some tweaks, but forgive me, I don't have your whole list in my head. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through the motions again, kind of discuss what your deck wants to do. Maybe the, uh, the, the place to start here is the land tax. Land tax, one white to cast for an enchantment from Legends that reads, during your upkeep, you can look up for three basic lands in your library if you have less lands than your opponent, right? So what you basically wanna do is you wanna make sure that you have less lands, then you can look up three basic lands, you've gotta show them, by the way, then put them into your hand, and then this is also important, then you shuffle your library, which is quite nice. You don't have to look up three basic lands, by the way. It can be one, it can be two, it can be three, it even can be zero. So you always then get that shuffle effect uh, from Lantex, but it only works if you have less lands than your opponent. Now there is a card in this deck, which I think is really cool, which is gonna help David having less lands, and that card is Dark Heart of the Wood. So Dark Heart of the Wood is a card from the dark, uh, one green, one black to cast, it's an enchantment as well, and it reads, sacrifice a forest, and then you gain three life, which is really nice next to Lantex, because you can sack your forest, you can gain life, make sure that you have less lands than your opponent, thus activating your Lantex again and taking out more uh, basic lands out of your deck the following turn. So that's just really great synergy. And talking about synergy, it also works together really well with Sylvan Library because for Sylvan Library, uh, one green and one also an enchantment. I think Tranquility would work well against this deck, by the way. Anyway, a Sylvan Library also an enchantment, one green and one to cast from Legends as well. It allows you to look at the top three cards of your library um, and then you can kind of put them in, in order. And if you want to draw an extra card, you can draw up to two extra cards and pay four life for them. So you can pay eight life and then you get to draw three cards during your draw step. So that's insane. But of course, when you're playing, uh, paying that big of an amount of life, you'll be killing yourself very quickly. But that's where Dark Art of the Wood is very handy, right? Because Dark Art of the Wood is gonna give you life. Lantex is gonna give you enough forest to fuel the Dark Art of the Wood. Another really cool thing here is, with Sylvan Library, you look at the top three cards of your library. So it's really nice to have a shuffle effect because what you do is you pick, probably pick the best card out of that uh, three cards, put that into your hand, and then the following turn, if Lantex triggers, it allows you to first shuffle before you look at the top three cards again. So th those three enchantments work together so well. And then of course there's this sorcery from white, Armageddon, that works really well with this strategy also because Armageddon reads all lands in play or destroyed for one white and three. So you destroy 
all the lands, that means that your opponent has to rebuild again. As soon as your opponent starts to play out some basics, it means your land tax get triggered or just some lands in general. It means your land tax gets triggered. You can use it again. And when we look at the rest of the deck, of course, we're going to see four mana birds because they were great with Armageddon. Even after an Armageddon, your mana birds still work. You still get mana. We see uh, to two Felwer stones. And also looking at how David has used his points, right? He's using uh, the Soul Ring and the Mox. That's four points out of 10. So it's really steep, but he's going for it because he really needs that mana. So I think just overall, this deck just kind of fits together like a puzzle, making it really, really strong. And even if you don't have all the pieces, the cards on themselves are strong enough, right? A Sylvan in play is already gives you tons of advantage. One land text gives you tons of advantage, but they just get better if you have those other cards to go with them. They're complementary, right? So I think it's really cool. I also love the single Mesa Pegasus in your deck, by the way, David. Really, really cool. Also love your sideboard plan with your three CD in the bottles where you take out your Urnums, put in your cities. You can choose between Spitting Slugs and Trikes. I like it. I think it's a really good deck. I think City in a Bottle is not going to do much in this matchup, by the way, because Rob's deck doesn't have any Arabian Nights, I think. Talking about Rob's deck, let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Agro Tex. And here we see the deck of Rob Hackney. And uh, yeah, this is really your classical Tex Edge, isn't it? So we just called it Agro Tex, but the basics of this deck are Lance Edge and Land Tex. So Land Tex, we talked about it just in a previous uh, uh, deck deck because David is playing with it as well. So land text basically is going to make sure that you draw a lot of lands. Well, draw, you take them out of your library, right? With land text. Lance Edge is an enchant world from Legends. It's red and it allows you to discard a land. Any player can do this and deal two damage to any target. So basically what you want to do with this deck is you want to save up enough lands in your hand and your land text is going to help you with that so that you can discard and you can kill your opponent on the spot. So you're not going to play out your Lance Edge until you've got enough basic lands in your hand to actually kill your opponent. Well, I, you know, that's what most players do. Let me put it this way. I don't know, of course, how Rob is playing it. Maybe he's got a different strategy, but most players don't play out the Lance Edge until it is too late. Now, as you can see, uh, Lance Edge is not the only way of how he can inflict damage to his opponent. And I think that's the great thing. Lance Edge is really a finisher in this deck. He's playing with a lot of weenie creatures, right? We see the Javelineers, we see the Savannah Lions, we see the Iron Claw Orcs. Those are the 12 creatures in his deck. He puts them on the board, he turns them sideways, he's going to deal some damage. Obviously, he's going to play with four Lightning Bolts, four Chain Lightnings. He's going to play with uh, the two AO piles. So all that is extra direct damage. So he can just deal tons of direct damage to his opponent. He's got also got the Mishra's Factories. So his deck is super aggressive. I think he wants to play a super short game, right? He just wants to attack, put his cards sideways. Then he wants to play out his Lance Edge and his, well, first his Land Tax and then his Lance Edge. Try to find enough lands to kind of finish his opponent by discarding his own lands. Now, the tricky thing with Lance Edge is though, especially when you're playing against an opponent that's also playing with land tax, your opponent can also discard uh, his or her lands from his or her hand, right? To deal two damage to you. So you've got to be careful with the strategy. It can, it can bite you in the ass if you make a wrong decision. Uh, what I think is going to work really well for Rob is the fact that David is playing Armageddon's. I think Rob really doesn't mind an Armageddon. I'm a little bit surprised he doesn't play Armageddon's himself, probably because of the points, because, you know, it, it does cost points. So again, you gotta, you, you can only spend 10 points, right? And here with the dice, you can see how Rob has spent his points, by the way. So one point for a land X each, that's four. One point for each factory, that's eight. And two points for the Mox, right? That makes 10. So I believe Armageddon is also a one point or two point card. So he cannot play Armageddon's here as well. That, that would have worked. He is playing with Winds of Change and Winds of Change is quite interesting because Lantex is going to help him fill his hand with basics, right? And maybe he then doesn't have a Lance Edge or he needs something else. He can play his Winds of Change and then he can shuffle all those cards back in and he can draw new cards and he can probably find some direct damage to finish his opponent off. So I think Winds of Change is mainly in here or to find your remaining Lance Edge or Lantex that you need to get things going or uh, to find that burn that you need to finish your opponent off, that one chain lightning, that one lightning bolt, you know? So I love the combination between Winds of Change and Lantex because Lantex is gonna give you enough cards in hand and with Winds of Change, you can 
exchange those basic lands you've got in your hand because of land tax for actual like burn cards that you may need to win the game. So I, again, I really like it. These are two decks that they seem to work really, really well. I guess they work really well because they both made it to the finals. And now the big question is which deck is going to work best or who's simply the luckiest? Let me know in the comments below what tax deck you think is going to win. Is it going to be David, the deck that we just looked at, or is it going to be this deck by Rob? Let me know and let me know why you think so. Okay, we talked about both of the decks. I'm kind of getting excited about this. I think it's really going to be a 50-50. Uh, now let's go to the games and find out who's going to be the champion of X Points 13. Game number one, here we go. And on the left, we have David with his Winter Ganon Tech uh, deck. Yeah, Winter Ganon Tax deck. That's what I wanted to say. It's white, it's green, and there's a little bit of black in the form of Dark Heart of the Wood. Pretty cool deck. And he's playing against uh, Rob, Rob Hackney, and he's playing white and red and he's playing aggro tech so both players playing with land taxes in their decks but um they have a completely different strategy so this could be very interesting and here we see a bolt the bird even though it's a chain lightning i'm just going to say bolt the bird so we've got fried chicken here and uh, that's been a classic move since 1993 and there we see a dark card of the wood so dark card of the, uh, the wood a card from the dark you can sacrifice a forest to gain three life. Here we see an Iron Claw Oryx. So this is what Rob wants to do, right? Play very aggressive, try to play out a lot of creatures very quickly. He's got a very low mana curve, doesn't need a lot of mana. So I wonder if he's gonna keep mana in hand as well. And he just wants to swing in. So I wonder if he's gonna attack now with the Mishra's Factory as well. I think he is, because his style is just very aggressive. Yeah, there we see an Animate, attack for four. Are we gonna see a Disenchant or a Swords? There is, yeah, there's the disenchant on the factory. So that's a good business for David. If you're David, you just want to survive the start of the game. I mean, his deck isn't slow. I mean, he's got swords. He's got ramp in the form of the mana birds. But, I mean, Rob's deck is just a little bit quicker. Here we see more pressure on the board here by Rob in the form of an Ecation Javelinier. So it's a 1-1 one, one from Fallen Empires. Ooh, there we see an Urnum Jin, 4-5 Powerhouse from Arabian Nights. And I wonder if Rob now has a Swords. If he doesn't, it kind of means it stops his attack right here. Or are we going to see a Swords here? Looks like he's a little bit into tank. Okay, tapping there his Plateau. And there's the Swords to Plowshares. Beautiful signed copy. So that means the Urnum is going to go. He's removed from the game and... David's life is going to go up to 22, but he's also going to take three points of damage, probably from the Iron Claw and the Javelinier. So he's going to drop back to 19 again. So he's basically gained one life. Not too bad. And there we see another, yeah, another creature. There's a Savannah Lines. There's going to be the pass here. So interesting to see if David, if David can find like another Urnum, that would be ideal. What would work really well now is a Lantex because of those Dark Heart of the Wood. So Dark Heart of the Wood allows David to sacrifice a forest for three lives. So he can sacrifice, uh, you know, his two of his forests, for example, um, or actually all three of them. And that would, uh, would put the Lantex online. That's what I'm trying to say. And it just, I don't think he's got Lantex or else he would have played it out already. It seems to... Um, he seems to be a little bit in the tank here. Trying to decide what he can do to kind of stop the bleeding. Okay, tapping one. Are we going to... Okay, we're going to see a Swords. I thought for a moment there we were going to see uh, a Lantex. Taking care of the Cajun Javelineers. And I think this kind of makes sense because the Cajun Javelineers has that Javelin counter on it. And that means it can deal one damage to any target. So it could kill, for example, uh, Birds of Paradise. So it can be really, really annoying, that one counter. And there we see an attack for four, of course. So Rob just playing aggressive, doing what his deck wants to do. Putting David on 15. And can he play out a creature? I mean, he wants to keep putting pressure on the board here. Looking at his plateaus. Playing a basic mountain. Tapping two. Okay, there we see an Aeopile 
in the AO pile is killing the mana birds. Those poor birds. I mean, the first one get fried, the second one get poisoned by the AO pile. Not cool. Okay, and there we see an icy manipulator, so an annoying little artifact, but David doesn't have five mana, so he cannot use it yet. So Rob can still swing in for four. I wonder if he's got a disenchant to take care of the icy, by the way. Tapping one. Okay, there's more pressure. A new Ecation Javelin ears. And David drops to 11. So a lot of pressure for David here. But remember, he's got the dark card and he's got the forest to sack. So he's not dead yet. It's going to be quite difficult for Rob to actually kill David with the dark card of the wood. But eventually, he will probably force David to start sacking forests. The question really is, can David find a land text before that happens? Playing out a soul ring, tapping the soul ring for two, and it looks like there's a, yeah, there's a winter orb. So that means that players can only untap one land during their untap step. And does this mean that David now has no cards in hand anymore? I'm not quite sure. That would be really bad news for David, because that means that Rob has an advantage here on the board and in cards and in life. So this game one is looking really good for Rob. So there's a tap down probably of the line or the, or the Iron Claw Orc. So there's the Iron Claw Orc being tapped down. There's probably going to be an attack for three here. So he's going to drop to eight. Rob perhaps thinking like, do I already want to play out a bolt on his life total or not? Decides to wait for it. There we see the un untapped step of David. Only one card in hand though for David, not a lot. It's looking bad for him. I mean, if he can just find Atlantex, he'll be back, you know, back in the game because then he can sack his forest for life. He goes up, he can find new forests because of the Atlantex and he can kind of can stay alive. And I think that's, of course, the scenario that, that Rob is fearing. There, okay, there's a bolt on end step, so he's going to drop to five. Interesting. He's going to untap. He can attack for three, of course, because I'm expecting uh, David to use his icy to tap down the Iron Claw again. Probably going to declare attacks, and then David can respond. So he's going to tap down the Iron Claw. Or the line, doesn't matter much. Okay, so I guess it's the Iron Claw again. Swing in for three. Yeah, swing in for three here. Going to put him on two. Okay, oh, here we see the Lance Edge. So Lance Edge allows you to discard a card and deal two damage to target a player or Planeswalker. There, there's the land being discarded. Two damage here, and there's, of course, the sack with the force. So that means he goes up to five, then he takes the two damage. He's on three at the end of that exchange. So what's important to note about the Lance Edge is that you can only deal damage to target player or planeswalker, not to a creature, for example. And I guess Rob is now passing the turn. Thumbs up. Yeah, he's, he's feeling pretty confident, but I'm sure Rob also knows that if David again, I'm just going to talk about the Lantex again. If David can find the Lantex, it's a completely different story. He's going to be back in the game, even though he's only on three. Looks like he can't find it, though. Did find another forest, so that's going to buy him some time. Going to draw his card for turn. And there we go, tap down of the orc again, dealing three damage. He's going to sack a forest here, that means he's going to stay on three. Are we going to see a bolt or something here from Rob to kind of force David to sack even more lands? Looks like they have a little discussion about life, but he's just on three because he sacrificed a forest for three life, gained, uh, took three damage from the two creatures.
There is a double discard. So four damage dealt. There we see a sec. That means he's going to go up to six. Then he takes four damage. He's back on two. So he's on two life. An interesting decision by Rob here to sec those or to discard those two lands. Now he could have waited a little bit longer. And oh, there's a land tax. Ho, ho, ho. This is so interesting. And a Savannah, which is also in Forest. So he could sack both lands, gain six, go up to eight. Before he does that, of course, he can tap, uh, use one of those lands to, uh, to activate the Icy to tap a creature. He's not going to die this turn. It's not going to happen yet. And because of that land tax, oh man, we could be in for a long game here because of that land tax. This is bad news for Rob. I mean, if he can find a disenchant, it's, it's all good again. But if he can't, I guess he's first going to attack. So there we see a, a tap down by David here. Is he going to go for the Iron Claw or, this, or the Lions? Doesn't matter that much. Tapping down the Iron Claw, it seems. Okay, so now Rob's going to attack for three. Okay, he's just going to attack for two, so he's going to sack a land, going to go back up to three then in that case. So second is Savannah. Going to three. Because he gains three life and takes two damage, so he goes plus one. In response, he's going to bolt, so he's going to sack a land to negate the bolt. Yeah, I guess both players are kind of now talking about the stack and how that goes. Yeah, then he takes the damage and then he goes to three. Exactly. I mean, it could get confusing very quickly. It's easy for me looking at this game, hoovering over it to kind of follow what's happening. But I can imagine when you're in it, you like need some time because you're responding to each other's moves, of course, with the stack. And now, I mean, this is so bad for Rob because now, <laughs> oh man, now David has Atlantex activation. He can start getting the forest, which equal life. This could take a long time. I think if you're Rob, you're hoping for more direct damage or maybe just, of course, a disenchant to take care of the tax or just a creature, just more bodies on the, on the ground to deal some more damage, forcing him to sack down, to sack all those forests. And at a certain point, he won't have enough because he can only play out one land a turn, of course. You know, despite the fact he's got the tax. And uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing, I guess, for Rob that he's on 21. Because that means he doesn't have to kind of worry for David to kind of try to get all the lands in his hand and discard those to kill Rob, actually. Because that's another scenario. Because of the lands. Actually, remember, both players can discard lands for damage. David shuffling up here. Playing a forest makes sense. You know, he needs those forests. Forest equals three life. It's as simple as that. And then we see Rob using his Javelinier counter to deal one damage here to David. So David's going to drop to two. And he gets to untap another land. So he's got two plateau. Rob drawing a card for turn. There he goes. He swings in, of course, first to tap down. Deals three damage. There's a sack of the forest. So he's going to remain on two. If he's got a land now, he can actually win it. But he doesn't. So just, just a pass. And again, attacks trigger. So David finding, of course, some more forests. Because the equal life. And it's so funny because he just has enough to stay alive every turn, right? He can sack the forest, gaining three life. That way, kind of preventing the damage he takes from the Javelineers and the Lion. 
But remember, David is also, of course, drawing a card in a turn as well. So maybe if he can find the swords or, you know, something else. It's just not over yet. But the same goes for Rob, of course. If he draws a land, if he draws um, direct damage, you know, both of these players, I mean, Rob still is pretty high up in the advantage bar, but just needs that one card to win it. And if David can find the right cards, he can start stabilizing as well. The great thing about Dark Heart of the Wood also is you can just sacrifice a forest. You don't have to sacrifice. Ooh, there we see a visitor. That's kind of annoying. Uh, he's going to go away, I hope. Okay, <laughs> okay, he's out of there. Uh, but what I wanted to say, the nice thing about Dark Heart of the Wood is um, you don't have to sack an untapped forest. So that's kind of great. There's the tap down of the Iron Claw. Attack for three. He's going to sack here. Which is to be expected. Okay, there's another creature. So this can actually help Rob next turn. I mean, obviously a basic land would have been better for Rob because then he would have just won the game on the spot. But this is also pretty good. I mean, David needs an answer now for one of the creatures. He needs the swords. Nope, that's it. Cannot find it. Yeah, there were so many outs for Rob at a certain point. But still, man, David, well done. And what a close match. Now both players are going to dive into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So we're going to see David on the play after losing that first game. And uh, there is a Mana Birds, Birds of Paradise. Let's see what Rob can do here, turn one. No Bolt the Bird, but this is also annoying here for David that he Cajun Javelineers. Remember the Javelin counter. So next turn... If the Javelineers is still there, it's probably going to throw its spear, its Javelin, at that poor bird. First, there's a Plains, though. Tapping two. Okay, there's the Dark Heart of the Wood again. If you're Rob, you're like, oh, man. <laughs> so there we see the kill of the birds. Makes absolute sense. And are we going to see an Iron Claw, Savannah Lines? Okay, we're going to see Mishra's Factory. Tapping a white. Are we going to see Savannah Lines here or another Ecation Javelineers? There we see a Savannah Lines and a pass probably. So David has got the pressure again that he had to deal with in game one as well. There we see another force and a pass. Rob can swing in here potentially for five. And then the question is, does David have, for example, a disenchant for the factory. He is going to animate, just like he did in game one, he plays it super aggro, dealing five points of damage here. David dropping to 15. That is killer. So David having just a lot of pressure against him. There we see another force tapping two, tapping three. Are we going to see spitting slug? There's a spitting slug, meaning that he probably boarded in. Or actually, no, because why would he board in the city bottle? No, he probably just boarded in the spitting slugs because they go a little bit faster and they're great blockers, of course, against the creatures of Rob. And you cannot bolt them. They've got four toughness. I mean, it's hard to deal with the spitting slug. So a very good uh, sideboard plan by David. This is going to buy him some time. That's exactly what he wants. Now, if you're Rob, you're like, man, is he going to use his swords here on the spitting slug? Would make sense if he has it. Is he going to do that? No, another Ecation Javelinier and a past turn. I mean, he could also uh, combine a Lightning Bolt with an Ecation Javelinier, of course. Use a Javelin counter to deal one damage. And then play a bolt or a chain to finish the snail off. There's five. There's a Sarah Angel. Ooh, it's looking really good for David. He simply has the bigger creatures. And if you play a deck like Rob, you don't like big creatures. They're kind of entering mid-range zone. That's not where you want to be when you're Rob. So this has got to be tough for him. Also, of course, Rob is missing his uh, red mana. Because again, if he's got a red source, he could potentially play a chain or a bolt on the Sarah 
Use the javelin counter to deal that last point of damage, at least killing the Sarah Angel. I mean, he's still on 20, he's got time. And the fact that he has to think so long is probably good news for David. Nope, taking the card back again. And it looks like he's just, is he just passing? Okay, there's a planes and a pass. I mean, he probably wants to find a red source, but a land tax for Rob would be really nice here as well, by the way, because David's got more lands. He can start looking for lands, also filtering out lands of his deck, finding other spells to kind of deal with the creatures of David. There's, of course, the attack for four. There's a swords in response. So he did have a swords. So we see David going back up here to 19. And are we going to see a Sylvan? Yep, there's the Sylvan Library. Great in combination with the Dark Art of the Wood and the Lantex, of course. There we see a Strip Mine. Is it going to go on the Mishra's Factory? Yeah, that kind of makes sense here. Stripping the Factories so is going to tap the Factory for one in response, it seems. Is he going to use that mana or is he not tapping it at all? It's gone now, anyway. Or is he going to play a disenchant here? Yeah, so disenchant. So use the mana to cast a disenchant. And now he's got to decide what he wants to disenchant. He's going to go for the Sylvan. Or not. Or is he going to go for the Dark Heart? We just don't know. <laughs> It's tough here. I think I would probably go for... Oh, it's difficult. I'd probably go for the Sylvan here, to be honest. But it, it's a tough decision because Dark Heart is also a really, really good card. Especially against Rob because he's playing an aggro strategy. And of course, if, if David can find a Lantex, you know, he can start activating using the Dark Heart to get the Lantex online. There's another Savannah Lines. Oh man, that Spitting Slug is doing so much work here. It's phenomenal to see. Tapping a white here. Oh, there's a Lantex. We could be in for a long game here. Remember, with Dark Heart of the Wood, David can sack the Savannah and the Three Forests for life, activating his Lantex. And uh, yeah. I wonder if he's going to do that, though. As you can see, by the way, I've kind of fast-forwarded the video from this point forward uh, because of the length of the games. So uh, just to, uh, to make sure that the video is not going to take too long. Also, obviously, the players need some time to kind of think about their moves, which, which I get. I understand. But I thought it would be better to kind of fast-forward it a little bit. Look at that. So he's sacking all the forests. He's going up. What's his life total now? Anyway, it's high. It's 15, 21, 27, 31 life. And now he's looking up his basic lance. Going to look up a forest, a plains. I mean, at a certain point, though, he's going to run out of basics. So, I mean, I think that's just a point that Rob's waiting for. For Rob... What he has to do here still is kind of take care of the spitting slug and just kind of accept the, situa the situation as is here for David. And of course, if you're Rob, not playing out any, any more lands. So there's a pass. So Rob really now just waiting to find maybe a red source to play some direct damage. Again, we see the sack by David, right? Because he wants to keep the land tax activated. So he's going to go up to 34. There's a forest. There's a basic plains as well. 
counting the amount of cards in hand. Of course, you don't want to force yourself to discard. I believe he's got four cards in hand, so then he would go up to seven if he finds three basics. Of course, he's going to play out the forest. Going to tank some more life, I guess. Only looking up two. Okay, interesting. I mean, there's also a danger for David if he, of course, sacks all his basic forests. He wants to keep some forests. The good news, of course, here for David is there's no pressure on his life, so he's not forced to sack. He's just sacking because he wants an active um, dark heart. Okay, this is quite interesting. There's a sword. Oh, for a moment, I thought we were going to see a disenchant. There's a sword, and what's interesting here, of course, is that Chaos Orb by Rob entering the battlefield. Is he going to use it on the spinning slug? That's the big question. Okay, there we see a bird. So we kind of see David deciding to not use the tags for now. I think if I would be Rob, I would, I would use it on the spinning slug and put some pressure on. You could also use it on a dark heart, I guess. I wouldn't do it on a tax because he's... He's, he's found so many basics already. I wonder how many he's got left in the deck at all. But that's just me. Six cards in hand, and he's going to pass turn. And there's a tap for four. There's an Icy Manipulator. And we're going to see a Disenchant, it seems. Oh, Divine Offering. That's pretty sweet, because that gives life to Rob as well. Going to go up to 25, so both of these players having tons of life. Now he's going to activate. No response, so this is a good moment to activate. And there's the hit. So the Spitting Slug is gone. There's an attack for five. So, um... Look like, it looks like he's going to drop to 23, I believe. No, he's on 28. 28, sorry, he's on 28. There's a Sarah Angel. Ooh, so the Spitting Slug is gone, but now there's a bigger problem for Rob, which is the Sarah Angel. So Rob finally finding a way to get rid of the Slug with that Chaos Orb. But now he's, uh, he's facing that Sarah Angel. Attacking both with both lines. Blocking one of the lions. Dealing two damage. He's going to go to 26. Playing a city in a bottle against those Urnims. But I wonder if those Urnims are still in the board at all. We haven't seen them yet. We did see the spitting slugs. There's an attack for four. So Rob dropping to 21 here. Tapping four. There we're going to see an icy manipulator again. Ooh. Another mana bird. Things are still looking really, really good for David. Going to go to seven. There's a pass. Probably going to take four more. Yeah, four more by the angel. Going to drop to 17. Tapping four. What are we going to see here? No, the Urnum cannot be played out because of the city in a bottle. Exactly has to take it back. So there's still Urnums in the deck. That's also good for Rob to kind of know because you could have the feeling, okay, maybe did he take out his Urnums? Am I playing this for nothing? But it's not for nothing. And there's a red source. Okay, this is good news here for Rob. Attacking for three. Now, is he going to block... With the Sarah. No, he's not, because he kind of knows if I block, he's probably going to bolt and kill the Sarah. So he's going to drop to 23. Still pretty high on life, obviously. And, and Rob here thinking about his options with the red mana he just found. But for David, I mean, it's still all good. You know, he's got, he's got the Sarah. He's got the Icy to tap down one of the creatures as well, if he wants to. Could also use it, of course, to tap down the red source. That would probably be best, by the way. Tap down the plateau, kind of forcing Rob's hand. There we see an end step bolt. What is he going to bolt, though?
on one of the birds, bolt the birds. So even if you've got two birds against you and a Sarah Angel, you still wanna fry the birds, right? It's just something that old school players do, I guess. Tapping down the Savannah line. Attacking here with the Javelineers, taking a point of damage, gonna drop to 22. There's a chain lightning on the other bird, okay? Of course, poor birds, I feel for the birds. Another attack with the Sarah. He's going to drop to 9. He's quite low. Tapping the line down. Attacking for 1. I mean, David's still in 21. Okay, there's a Swords on the Sarah. Oh, this is sweet. Saving the Sarah Angel there. There's a Bolt. Oh, wow. Avoid Fate there. To save the Sarah Angel. That is huge for David. Look at the life total of Rob going down and down and down. He's on five. There's a pass. And he's going to tap down the line. I guess, no, he's going to tap down the plateau this time. Using the bolt on the Sarah, it seems. So he's kind of hoping for another red source, perhaps. Attacking here with the line. No. He could also attack just with the Javelin here, though. So they're going to trade. Perhaps I would have just attacked with the Javelin here. Anyway, it doesn't matter much, I think. Ugh. It's going to go up to six, going to drop to two. Rob is almost done for. That would make this a 1 1 here in the finals. He's on two life, needs an answer. Nope, that's it. Oh, so it is one, one. And I hope you understand why I kind of fast forwarded a little bit. But a one, one now between these two players. Who, yeah, that's Sarah Angel. And he, ah, it's so annoying that Icy, right? Taps down your red source and, uh, and then you cannot use your bolt anymore as a surprise. Really shows the, the, the flexibility that an Icy ha has. You know, it's one of the reasons I like the cards so much. Anyway, 1-1, uh, one, one, both players perhaps going back into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. No, game number three. Game number three, here we go. So it's 1-1. One, one. That's what you want to see in the finals, right? You want to see 1-1. One, one. There we see an Ecasian Javelineers. So Rob has a little advantage, right? Because he's the player on the play and he's already got the aggressive deck. Savannah, and there's a Bolt. So 21 for Rob, losing the Javelineers here, turn one. Finding a Factory and Aeopile. So Aeopile, you can sack, deal two damage to any target. There we see two creatures being played by David. Birds of Paradise and the Elves of Deep Shadow. I mean, I'm expecting an attack here by the Factory, or does he want to use the Aeopile? Perhaps if he's got a land, he can actually do both. Okay, there's a land tax. Ooh, interesting. I think because of the land tax, I would be tempted to use the Aeopile here on the Birds of Paradise. Yeah, that's exactly what he does. And there's a pass. So Rob going for a slightly different strategy here. So tap down three. There's the Spitting Slug again. That Spitting Slug did so much work in game two. And now it's back again to hunt Rob. He's like, not again, not the Spitting Slug. And as a, as a blue player, I play a lot with, um, with Ghost Ship, which also has four toughness. So I know how tough it can be against some, for some opponents to get rid of a four toughness creature. And there is the Ecation Javelineers again. So he's, he's perhaps not playing Lance because he's hoping that David is going to, and then he can activate his tax. And that's, of course, with these text games, right? It's like um, like a staring in the eye contest, like this Wild West situation where you're looking at each other, waiting for the first person to draw their gun. There we see a Swords on the Javelineers, which makes sense because the Javelineers can kill the Elves of Deep Shadow. There we see a Sylvan Library. Is there going to be an attack here? No, there's not going to be an attack. Like, David's really like, okay, I'm not the aggressor here. I don't want to take unnecessary damage from, uh, from the factory next turn. I just want to keep my Spitting Slug on blocking duty. And I think that's a very good decision. 
And if you're David, you're probably going to use that Sylvan to, to look for, um, for some more mana dorks. There is another Lantex. Yeah, that's always a bit... You don't want to have two Lantexes. It's not the worst, especially if, if, you know, if they have a disenchant, then you know for sure that you're going to keep one Lantex. But at this stage in the game, okay, there's a Lantex by David. So now we're seeing the Lantex game. And uh, David being on 18, Rob being on 22. So this is really different if you compare this to the first two games where Rob was really playing super aggressively both those games. And now because Rob is finding those taxes, he's kind of choosing a different strategy. So two cards in hand for David, five cards in hand for Rob. Ooh, activating it, attacking with the 2-2, taking the damage, going to 16, and there's a pass. And I think the reason that David's not blocking, he knows if I block, then Rob can play out a mountain and can play out a chain lightning on my spinning slug. In the second main phase. So I think this is a good decision. And David here just attacking for one, just picking up one card. So we see Rob dropping to 21. I mean, both players don't want to play out any lands because of those land taxes. It's so funny. I wonder if Rob's going to do the same here. Yeah, he's, why not? I mean, He's dealing more damage. He's up on life. Are we going to see a, a disenchant or something? The thing is, of course, Factory is also a land. So if he kills the land, he's activating Rob's land tech. So usually it's a downside of Factory, right? When you animate it, it gets like super vulnerable. But when you're playing with land techs, you don't really mind people killing it. Sometimes, you know, people even strip their own lands with land techs, which is also a good move. There's the attack now by the Spitting Slug. There's a Birds of Paradise. So kind of David now realizing, okay, I'm not going to block anyway, so I might as well just attack, and I think this is a good decision. And this is, the Mana Birds is actually really good here for David, because it means an extra mana to spend. So he could potentially play out an Urnum Jin next turn, which would be a big problem for Rob. I wonder if Rob is now going to keep his factory on blocking duty. Right, because he can then block the spinning slug. It's really just, it's kind of funny to see, because usually that's a thing you always worry about. Oh, I'm going to animate my factory, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, it's a good thing. Seven cards in hand for Rob. And David, it looks like he's looking at the first cards because of the Sylvan trigger, of course. Attacking, so we see Rob dropping to 15. So it's 15 against 12. There's Dark Heart of the Wood. So this is a big deal because now he can Dark Heart of the Wood his way into a tax activation. This is a big problem for Rob. Seven in hand, eight in hand. He can start playing out lands now at least. He doesn't have to wait anymore. And he needs to find a way to put pressure on the life total here of David, or at least find a disenchant to take care of the dark heart of the wood or the tax. We'd probably go for the tax here then. He's playing a mountain. Tapping. There's a chain. Is that going to be on the birds? Going to be on the bird. And there's a disenchant. Okay, now he's got to choose what he wants to disenchant. You're taking care of the tax. That's a good decision. At least that's my, my opinion. Because he hasn't used the tax at all. So there's still so many basics there in the Library of David. Ooh, playing out an Urnum. This is bad news for Rob. And because of the dark heart of the wood, right? I mean... David can kind of manage his amount of lands. So there seems to be some discussion about the life total, perhaps. So there is, he was on, okay, so he wasn't 17. Attack with the factory goes to 15. 
Oh, taking a damage from the Elves of the Deep Shadow. That makes sense. Going to 14. Then sacking a land. If he wants to sacking force, he would go back up to 17. There's the attack by the Spitting Slug. So David dropping to 13. I mean, these things are important. You know, one life can be the difference between winning or losing a game. In this case, the finals. Remember, it's 1-1. Final game. There is that city in a bottle again, taking care of the Urnum Jin and another Mishra's factory here. David looking at three cards again. He's being very careful, right? Doesn't want to pay extra life because of the type of deck that he's playing against. Playing a Birds of Paradise here. And passing turn. So no attack by the Spitting Slug. Wanting to keep a blocker for those uh, Mishra's factories. There could be a scenario here where Rob can attack with one factory, pump it with the other, make it a 3-3, so then when he blocks on the Slug, it's not going to die, and then he can play a Chain or a Bolt, killing the Spitting Slug. So Rob really in the tank here, trying to figure out what the best next move is. Tapping here the mountain. Okay, animating the factory, it seems. Attacking with the 2-2 factory. There's a disenchant. Okay. There's a Mox Pearl. And a pass. Four cards in hand for Rob, it seems. And three cards in hand. Oh, he's taking an extra card. Going to drop to 10. Interesting. I wonder what he's found. Perhaps a land tax. Remember, he's got, of course, the Dark Heart of the Wood, so he can sack forests to gain life. Perhaps a Sarah Angel. Are we going to see... Oh, we're going to see a Triskelion taking a damage. Going to see a Trike, which is really good against the deck of Rob. Remember, Rob's deck is full of little weenie creatures. An attack with the Spitting Slug for two, it seems. That would mean Rob would drop to 11, if I'm not mistaken. Or are we going to see a Swords? No, we're going to see an animation, a block and a pump. That makes sense, of course. But then, in response, David could kill the Mishra's Factory if he wants to with the Trike. And then he can choose, do I want to sack Forest? Because the way the battlefield is looking at the moment, Rob is going to be able to activate his land tax for the first time. But of course, David, before he passes his turn, can choose to use his Dark Heart of the Wood. So David really into tank here, it seems, trying to find, do I want to respond with my Triskelion? Oh, it's a Divine Offering. Interesting. So he's killing the factory and killing itself so that Rob is not gaining any life. And now he's sacking a Tensor Forest just to make sure that Rob cannot activate his land tax, which I think is a very good move. There's a Savannah Alliance. It's looking good for David, and I'm, st I'm still very impressed with the Spinning Slug. It's doing so much work for him, again. I think, you know, if you look at the Dark as a whole, it's always seen as a weak set. But there are some real gems in there. I mean, Dark Heart of the Wood, of course, being one, but also Spinning Slug. Ghost Ship is a great card. There are just a few really good cards in the dark. And of course, a lot of very cool cards. Like Skull of Orm. I think Skull of Orm is probably my favorite card from the dark. There's an attack for two. And Rob dropping here to 11. Looks like both players are on 11 now. 
there is another spinning slug. <laughs> it's like a spinning slug festival. There's definitely going to be a spitting slug on the, on the cover for this match. Whether, whether David, whether you win or lose, th there's going to be a spitting slug on the cover. It looks like there's a tap by the mocks. No, there's not. The winds of change. Which, I mean, it makes sense for Rob. He can kind of find three new cards. Both players shuffling up, by the way, which is relevant because of David Sylvan. So despite the fact that David has no cards, he is taking a little bit of advantage, well, a little, a pretty big advantage, out of this Winds of Change. That is really sweet for David. But it makes sense that Rob's doing this. He is losing. And it's going to give him three new cards. So probably the three cards he had in hand were just worthless. Needs to find something. There's another line. So he could, if he wants to double block the Spitting Slug. Then again, Spitting Slug can get first strike for one green and one. So yeah, you probably don't want to do that because then you're just killing your own lions. So David looking at three new cards, deciding to draw two of those, dropping to 10, attacking with both Spitting Slugs. There's a double block, so I believe he can give it first strike now. Choosing not to, though. So that means the other two creatures get first strike. The creatures that block Spinning Slug, if you don't pay uh, one green. Oh, and that's why he's not paying it, because he wants to play the Sarah Angel instead. So he's losing a Spinning Slug, but he's able to play a Sarah Angel. Sacking some lands, going back up to 12. And here you can really see Sylvan and Darkheart of the Wood working together so, so well. Okay, and this is also an option. So it looks like... Interesting here. I'm not quite following here, but it seems that David has changed his mind, taking it back, deciding to give the Spitting Slug first strike. So the way Spitting Slug works is if you pay one green and one, it gets first strike. If you don't pay that tax the creatures of the opponent gain first strike. So it seemed, seemed there for a moment that um, David chose to let his Spinning Slug getting killed. And in return, of course, he was able to have enough lands to play out his Sarah Angel. But he's, he's making a different decision here. I mean, he'd, he'd rather just kill both of the Savannah lines and keep his Spinning Slug. There's a Chain Lightning. Taking care of the Elves of Deep Shadow. Interesting. Perhaps because it's got one power, because he also could have gone for the Birds of Paradise, of course. But he's on a pretty low life total, so I do get it. And there's a Disenchant. I mean, it's too little too late, isn't it? I mean, it looks like he's going to go for the Dark Heart. And there's the attack. Yeah, Dark Heart's gone, right? Okay, I was a little bit confused. Attack here by the two, Spinning Slug. So Rob's going to drop to five. I mean, it's looking really bad here for Rob. I think he's just going to lose. He's going to go to one because of the slugs. It's really, I mean, it's really cool to see Spinning Slug doing so well. I've seen decks of uh, DFB with Spinning Slug doing really well as well. Yep, that's it. That's it. Spitting Slug! And here we can see the creature Spitting Slug. How cool is that? So a big congratulations here to David for winning X Points Finals number 13. And uh, his deck has done it again. Like I said, it was also an X Points Final 12. This is really a good deck, a force to be reckoned with. And I wonder, hint, hint, if they're going to do something with the land tax. I wonder. <laughs> anyway, uh, I would first like to thank both players for, uh, for playing and showing their skills here and allowing me to put it here on Timmy Talk. So thank you, David and Rob. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to see you guys play. There's so much thought into 
into when you make a decision. So that's always interesting. I hope that my uh, commentary kind of made sense there. It's also hard for me to follow from time to time. I also would like to thank Louis, the organizer of X Points, AKA Luki. And if you want to join the X Points, please check the description below because there you can find a link to their Facebook page and uh, you can join for free. You know, it's, uh, it costs nothing. Talking about uh, things that you can do for free. Uh, thank you, first of all, for watching this video. If you're not a subscriber yet, please consider to subscribe and ring that bell. So all that really, really helps uh, the channel move forward. And then there are three things that you can do that are completely free. The first thing is like this video, hit that thumbs up button. It really means a lot and it really helps the channel. Also, you can leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this matchup. For example, at a certain point in this video, I started to fast forward because it got a little lengthy. Let me know if you liked it fast forward mode or if you want me to kind of to show you the match in, uh, in real time speed or if you just don't care. Let me know, I would love to hear from you so I can make my videos um, better because I'd love to continue improving myself and improving the content that I show right here on Timmy Talks. Then the last thing that you can do, you can share this uh, content on your social. So if you like it, share it with your friends, help the channel move forward. Then um, you can also become a patron of the channel. And uh, by becoming a patron, you also sponsor Timmy Talks financially and you're helping me Getting, uh, getting new gear I'm saving up for a camera at the moment and you're also helping me to go out to tournaments all over Europe and kind of show you live streams from those events. So maybe it's interesting, maybe it's something for you. It already starts with a dollar a month. It is not a lot. So please consider becoming a patron of the show. The cool thing is if you do, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord and uh, you get to join the Timmy Talks online events and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. End scroll, what end scroll? Well, this end scroll. Let's take a look at the amazing wunderbar patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Here we go. Ik het dus, ik het dus, somber gezien.